Hello, hello. Welcome, world of JavaScript, to another sunny, bright javascript day. Today on the show, we have... Uh, I'll just introduce our guest first, actually. I'm going to break tradition here. We have Javon Makmali. Come on down. Tell us a little bit. Thanks so much for having me. All right. That was a lot. I think everybody <laughs> knows a lot. We're going to learn a lot more. Okay. We've also got our good baldy, Chris Ferdinandi. Hey, it's Chris, the Vanilla JS guy, and AJ is right. I I am very bald. Thank you for rubbing that in, AJ. No problem. Always happy to help. And then we've got Christopher, which I you, I never see your last name because it's always hidden and I always forget it. It's Beekler. That's right, Beekler. Hello from Providence, Rhode Island, where it was pouring rain earlier and now it is bright and sunny again. And Amy Knight. Hey, hey, from Nashville. All right. And this is Solder JS, yo, 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 coming at you live from Provo. Get Datadog for visibility into your entire application from browser to the code base and all the way down to the infrastructure. Get proactively alerted on any client side issues such as JavaScript and network issues. Optimize the load time on your front end resources and detect any UI issues that affect critical user journeys. Discover that it isn't a front end problem. You can tie all this information to corresponding back end traces, code level errors, infrastructure level metrics, and even related logs in seconds without any querying. Try it out today here, https colon forward slash forward slash dtdg, that's data dog without the vowels, dot co slash JavaScript Jabber. Today we are talking about tricks. Tricks. Yeah. Tricks yeah. are for kids. And adults or oh, wow. semi, semi-adults who work on the internet. Okay. Okay. Tricks is for adults that work on the internet. And tricks is something to do with UI stuff, something, something. Why don't you, John? Kick us off with a little bit of intro about what this is. Sure. So Trix is a rich text editor for the web. It's a purposefully simple editor. It's limited in in its scope and, and the kinds of things you can compose within it. So it's not a full page layout tool. It's for our tagline is everyday writing. So the kinds of things that you often write on websites like in comments with lists and bullets and bold text and whatnot, but it's not a it's not a full blown layout tool. Chris was saying something like it's similar to MCE. Is that no? It's way better than Tiny MCE, largely because it does so little. It's just a really nice simple. So Tiny MCE is kind of the go to WYSIWYG um, for most kind of GUI based text editors. And what I like about Trix is that it is very much not. Tiny MCE. It's simple. It's lightweight. It has some nice features, like you can drop in images and stuff. But it um, it's just it's a much simpler kind of interface to work with, and has really good documentation too. Tiny MCE is kind of the I don't know if it's the first, but it's it's the editor that a lot of people um, have seen. It was in WordPress a while back, and it's kind of a jet engine of you know, you know you can imagine like the comical screenshot of the toolbar with seven rows of buttons and all the little formatting toggles and tiny mce like a lot of editors before say 2015 is just based on a, a browser feature called content editable that basically allows for editing any segment of a web page or the entire thing just by adding this attribute to the element and uh, it has a really old and confusing history. It was uh, introduced, I think it was 1999 in Internet Explorer 5.5. I had no idea it was that old. That's crazy. And and it was kind of just quietly introduced because Microsoft needed it to build a tool that you might remember called Microsoft Front Page, which was a web page publishing kind of WYSIWYG desktop app. And uh, it used Internet Explorer as its internal rendering engine. So content editable just kind of made its way to the web because of that. And uh, it was never really a spec. It was never really part of the HTML spec. But because Internet Explorer was dominant at the time, all the other browser vendors added it, but without a spec. So they kind of just like reverse engineered and tried to copy uh, more or less what Internet Explorer was doing. And as a result, every browser did it a little bit differently. So I had a question. I suspect you may have just answered my question, which was why not just use like the native browser feature? Why use the library? And is it because there's not a spec that was followed between all the browsers? 
All right, so um, you should use the browser feature if it works for you. Um, what we found was that the cross-platform differences were kind of a nightmare. There's just no yeah. consistent yeah. results. And, you know, I, wor I work at Basecamp. We've built three versions of Basecamp over the, like the last 15 years. And we've had, I don't know, five variations of editors across all the versions. And before Trix, we just had a support nightmare where, you know, something would happen in one browser for one customer based on some weird content that they pasted into their editor and they couldn't get out of, or they couldn't undo, or they couldn't break out of a bulleted list, or couldn't delete a bullet. Or one customer would type their text and it would end up being paragraph tags. Others were divs, you know, as there's no, it was um, really hard to reason with the output or the input. So I guess um, backing up a little bit, editors like Tiny MCE and there's the, there's a whole bunch um, in that category. The strategy for a long time when you're building an editor like that and you wanted to control it, you would tell content editable to say, make this text bold or you know insert a block quote or insert a list. And then you'd wait for it to do it and then you'd look at the resulting HTML and you'd try to clean it up to normalize it. But there's just so many variations of how it might change. That's a really hard thing to do. If you look at like the issue trackers for some of those editors, it's kind of funny, actually. We looked at a few before we started building tricks, like three similar editors, and they all had like almost exactly 2,200 issues. I mean, you know, give or take a couple hundred. And I just kind of decided like that's how many content editable bugs there are. Like there's about 2,200 possible bugs. <laughs> And then if browsers make updates, et cetera, it's just a game of whack-a-mole and it's, um, it's frustrating. So we decided after many years of that to try to tackle it. And that's, that became tricks. So is the goal to simplify content editable and to, you know, if you're still working with content editable, aren't you still subject to those 2,200 bugs or are you, how are you getting around that problem? Yeah, so when we started, we kind of had the assumption that we couldn't use content editable. And we looked at some reliable editors on the web, like Google Docs, for example. And if you look at look closely at what they're doing, they're not using content editable. They basically have to reinvent an input on the web. So if you look closely, like the cursor isn't a real cursor, it's a blinking div. And they have to manage every key press, every selection change. And it's, it's totally doable, but it's really complicated. Like we started just, like if you open up a text editor, you know, on your computer and you paste in a bunch of text and you just press the arrow keys around and start noticing kind of how nuanced some cursor changes can be, like pressing the up arrow to the line above it that has larger text, like does the right thing and it feels really natural. But if you think about how you'd have to implement that, it's hard. And so we didn't want to do that. It'd be too much work. So we started testing this idea of using content editable basically for everything except editing content. <laughs> so we let the browser uh, manage, you know, selections cursor movement because it does that really well. But we control the entire rendering experience. We basically just treat it like an input element, but not an editor. And I can go more into how that works or kind of give an overview of that if you'd like. We basically just add a handful of probably a dozen or so event listeners for things like, you know, key press and record that input. So you press the A key, we translate that event into the letter A, and we translated it into a, an editing operation in Trix on our own internal document model. And then we render from that document the HTML that we want we compare what content editable did. And if it did the right thing, then we can just kind of leave what's there on screen. But we have our own, you know, modeled version of that uh, document on the side. And if content editable did the wrong thing, we just outright re-render the whole thing. And so that way we get consistent output, you know, reliable HTML that we expect and we can control what happens uh, with every change. So when, when you say if it does the wrong thing, how do you know that it does the wrong thing? So um, 
let's say, for example, you're writing a bulleted list and you're at the end of a line and you hit return. We record that input, goes into our model. Content editables say indents the list or creates a new list. But our model has the right data. The model uh, tricks internally, renders the model into HTML in a detached um, DOM element and just compares it to what content editable did on its own. And so if our internal representation ever looks different, we swap it in with the one in the browser. So this really seems like something that Markdown, that there should be some sort of parity between this and Markdown, because it looks like basically everything that your editor supports is stuff that's supported in Markdown. So I'm curious... Do you have any markdown conversion? Is that a plan at all? Or are you just really not worried about that? Well, it, I mean, it's certainly um, conceptually similar to markdown in that it's a purposefully simple set of formatting. And I, I like markdown. I use it. Um, but I have a, a feeling that it would not be nearly as um, popular as it is today if uh browsers weren't so bad at doing WYSIWYG editing for so long. Like it's a, it's a solution to not doing WYSIWYG editing because it was bad and it solves a lot of other problems, but Trix is a WYSIWYG editor. So what you see is what you get. It's like a word processor. So conceptually the output of Markdown is very compatible to the output of Trix, but the input mode is not Markdown. You just format your text as you're writing it. Okay. So I'm still a little bit, I look, I like I'm, I'm actually looking at some of this stuff at the same time, so I have missed a couple words here and there, but I'm a little bit confused. What is exec command? So exec command is part of the content editable API provided by browsers, and it's how you would implement a, um, a sort of super simple WYSIWYG editor that builds on top of content editable itself. And it's how things like tiny MCE work. So, you know, you can imagine you have a div that's content editable and you also have a toolbar with a bold button. The way you would wire up that kind of editor is when you click the bold button, you execute the exec command API and tell it to format bold. And what the result of that formatting is you don't have control over. So it might use, the browser might wrap the selected text in a, you know, a B tag or a strong tag. You're just telling the browser, do bold now, please. And what that means is up to the browser. So I'm looking at the MDN, the Mozilla Developer Network, Mm -hmm. and it says exec command is supported by every browser. It's like green straight across. And then it has a bunch of stuff, which I'm guessing is like the older commands from the 90s. Mm -hmm. And it's like spotchy support where there's like green and red all over the place, but exec command is just like straight green. So is exec command something that is usable for you and pretty reliable or is it not? It's reliably supported um, in browsers going, you know, way back, but it's also exec command is, so content editable itself isn't necessarily the unreliable thing. Using exec command to build a WYSIWYG editor is kind of the the unreliable path. And so Trix does not use exec command whatsoever. And editors prior to kind of the era of Trix, and there's some other uh, newer editors in its category, exec command was the way to build an editor. Now it's not. So it's, it's supported in all browsers, but the support sucks in all browsers. It's not so much the support. Like, say, for example... Um, you know, you have a website that has comment fields and you want to use CSS to style the content when it renders. If you don't know that the browser is going to say generate uh, bold text with a B or a strong or italic text with an I tag or the M tag, or if it's going to create paragraphs with, or, or divs, it makes it really hard to format that content and using content editable with exec command is just going to give you that unreliability. So someone using Firefox might generate totally different Understood. HTML than Chrome or Internet Explorer. That would be my definition of sucks, by the way. It's, it's, it's rough. So with Trix, 
you you output consistently in all browsers, do you use uh, class names or do you just stick with B, I, strike through? How do you do it? Yeah, we don't have uh, class names. Um, it's just uh, semantic, clean HTML that comes out. So pretty much just tag names. So what, what does that mean? Is So is it strong? Is it B? Oh, is yeah. It I mean, it be bold? it's technically configurable using the Tricks API, but strong for bold, M for italic, block quote for quotes, you know, pre-tag for code blocks. And then Trix also has support for attachments, which use figure, the figure element with a fig caption and image tag. I don't even know about those. Does anybody well, else know about those? It's like a semantic wrapper around images for, for adding. Uh, it's the right way to caption an element if you want to write a caption below the image. And, and this is like a, a standard thing. This is... Like yeah. this- This has existed in HTML for some amount of time? I think it's, uh, so, you know, we target HTML5, which I don't know how long that's been out, but a long time. And there's really eight tags that Tricks might output, and they're all HTML5 standards. Okay, well, when I hear HTML5, it's just, that doesn't mean anything to me. Like That's what all of the modern web is today. Yeah, but like strong is not HTML5. Strong has been around since like, what, 1997? Uh, That's true, but it's more semantic than the B tag, which doesn't have any semantic meaning. It just means bold. I guess what I'm trying to get at is like, you're saying HTML5, but it's not like buzzwordy, cool, new HTML5. This is is nothing stuff that works. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, to be fair, AJ, HTML5 is not really new at this point. Either, right? Like it was quasi old news when I started my development career, however many years ago. I, I don't know. I only see HTML5 used as like buzzwordy stuff and it doesn't mean anything to me. So that <laughs> I will say, Javon, my, one of my favorite things about this project is that to your point, it's primarily just markup. I really like that you're using what the web gives you out of the box. Hearing you talk about the way like Google Docs works with all the kind of the div that like blinks on and off and stuff like you can do that sort of thing but like it's just it's so much work to recreate stuff that the browser already does out of the box so this is really cool so tricks was built by um two people me and sam stevenson my coworker, and even without having to you know reinvent the cursor and all those things we it was still a year and a half of work for two people building something like google docs is like a many year size project. It's Google not- Docs is great if you're a multi billion dollar company that exactly has tons of coders and everything. And it's incredible. Same with um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't think it's used nearly as widely, but uh, Apple's Pages mm-hmm. uh, they have a web version, and it's similarly built. I think they use SVG under the hood, or maybe Canvas. But um, you know, it's a, it's another one where they control the entire editor experience, and it's. It's a desktop grade app built in your browser, which is mind blowing. One thing I really, really like about the Trix website is that the product is literally just like baked into. I don't know if you guys have been there yet, but if you go to tricks editor.org, you can actually play with the Trix editor live in the browser. So, like, there's not a separate demo page or anything. You just you go there and you can start using it and see how it works. And it's just really like, for me, that was one of my favorite things about this project. It's just really neat to be able to just jump right in and cool, you know, thanks. install um, anything or set anything up. Like there's no, the the barrier from I know nothing about this to I can see how it works is zero. And that's awesome. That um, sounds like a WYSIWYG editor. Uh, there's a little <laughs> Easter egg on that site too, is that um, file uploads and attachments uh, work. So if you drag an, an image from your computer into that editor... It actually gets stored on S3 for 30 days, but it, it shows you how the how easy file attachments are with tricks as well. Javon, you mentioned earlier that one of the problems people had with tiny MCE and similar is that they'll uh, they'll paste something complex probably from a Word document or whatever and get sort of stuck in that formatting. How do you handle nuking the formatting in sort of a an intelligent way where you're retaining as much as you can, as much as the editor supports, but uh, getting rid of the the extraneous cruft. So, like I said, Trix listens for this handful of input events. Um, one of the events that browsers provide is a paste event, which allows you to kind of intercept pastes. So you can 
handle the paste event, cancel it, read the HTML that's going to be pasted, and then do something with it. And Trix has its own, uh, it's an HTML parser that uses a browser APIs to do its thing, but it, it kind of uh, normalizes any HTML into something Trix can understand because there's a lot of tags that Trix doesn't support. Trix actually doesn't even support t- tables. Um, but if you paste a table, Trix will kind of just walk through all the DOM nodes that were pasted in. And if it understands them, like if you paste a div or a strong, et cetera, those just get converted directly into the document model. If it's something that's not supported, kind of just walks through all the text nodes and tries to pull out all of the content without all of the surrounding context and formatting that it can't represent. So generally, it, it's, it just works. You know, if you paste an entire web page, you're not going to get great results. But if you copy from Microsoft Word, it usually just works. And the great thing about Tricks being in Basecamp is a lot of people use it every day and we get customer reports when things don't work. So over time, we've just kind of built up a pretty significant test suite of a lot of the weirder edge cases and strange paste sources. But it's actually really not, I mean, it's probably the HTML parsing and normalizing code is maybe a couple of hundred lines at most. So what's the bulk of the code then? So there's a, a couple different layers. Um, there's this the, the model layer. So Trix has its own document model that has editing operations on it. So things like uh, insert string at range type things where you're just manipulating the document itself. And so that's at the, the very highest level. And that's a, it's a format that serializes to JSON and back and can be rendered as HTML. So that's one, one layer. Uh, there's an input layer that handles recording all the input and then transforming that into an operation on the document. There's a fair amount of selection management. So the browsers, DOM, have APIs for you know, reading and setting the selection. And it's actually probably the trickiest API to work with and get right. It's a, it's a difficult API to translate into something simple. So there's that. And it sounds like there's actually not that much to it, but somehow it ends up being a lot of code in the end. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've wondered, like, how in the world do you get a selection? Like, how do you know what is highlighted by the cursor? What, what, what does that look like at all? Yeah, so just generally, there's, a, there's an API for getting the selection document gets selection, which returns a selection object. And then a selection can have one or more ranges. And typically, there's just one range. I think Firefox actually supports having multiple selections, but... Uh, that's weird. So you could build a VS Code in Firefox, right? <laughs> cursors, but that that range has a start and an end, and each of those is a DOM node, like either a text node or an element, and an offset, a number. And from that, you can you can hone in on the exact selected position. And then the reverse is you can set a DOM range um, using the same APIs, so you can programmatically create a selection on the screen using the same APIs. The hard part, or the tricky part, is turning that into a range that maps with the R internal document model. Our model is, it's a flat list. So uh, you can think of HTML as like a, a tree structure, but Trix represents everything as a list. So it literally looks like a, a list of pieces of text, which have associated metadata, like the formatting. So we uh, have to convert this DOM selection, which comes from a tree, and flatten it into uh, essentially just two numbers, a start and an end. So position two to position five. So we make that selection API uh, a lot easier to work with when you're using tricks. Um, Trix's API, you can um, set a selected range from zero to five or any numbers, and it will select the text in the editor. That would be probably the first five characters in the editor, regardless of the formatting. So, you know, if you 
if zero to five is nested in three bullets and formatted bold, you still are using the same API set. You set the range from zero to five and it converts that into a DOM range. I'm uh, curious about the multiple undos that you have. Is that something that comes along with content editable and you're leveraging that or did you have to write out your own code to provide that functionality? You can, uh, content editable does support undo, but because we're not using it to actually do the editing, uh, we can't use it. So tricks, records, and undo and redo stack. And those are just snapshots of the document at certain intervals or after formatting changes. And undoing is basically just switching back to a previous version of the document. Gotcha. Thanks. One thing that worked out to our advantage, actually undo and history were just kind of one of the, I I think they were one of the last features we added. Our document model itself is immutable. So it's every editing operation you make to it returns a new document. By reference, the new document contains all of the pieces from the previous document plus any changes or minus any changes. And they're the same references to the same pieces of text. So we can create, you know, if the undo history is enormous, it's actually not that much data because most of the document snapshots reference existing objects in memory that are shared across them. So that that decision to model our, our document that way just lended really nice undo history support. Very cool. I have a far less technical question. I'm just curious, uh, having been on large product rollouts before with big audiences who are used to an existing product, I know that inevitably there's quite a bit of backlash when you make the changes. Uh, when you guys actually rolled this out for Basecamp, how was the reception? How did you deal with that? Yeah, so we kind of had um, the luxury of also rolling out a new version of Basecamp at the same time. So there are currently three versions of Basecamp and they're completely separate applications. Um, Customers, we still have customers on the original version, version two and now version three. And so when we've done those new versions, we've, because they're separate applications, customers haven't been forced into them. They're, um, they have an option to migrate to the newer versions, but they're not forced to. So Trix rolled out with Basecamp 3. We built it for Basecamp 3 uh, specifically. So we did not have any customers previously using it. And so everything was kind of new for everyone. Had we brought it to, you know, say Basecamp 2 and removed features or something, I'm sure we would have gotten a little backlash. But a lot of the motivation to build tricks was the editor we were using in Basecamp 2. Like we had a lot of frustrated customers and um, we were frustrated, you know, for the same reasons. That makes sense. If you can simplify without ticking off the uh, core people who are using a given thing, that's a really good way to do it. Yeah, I think it's worked out really well for Basecamp, the company, just to to deal with, you know, new versions of Basecamp in that in that fashion. It's no one wakes up and everything's changed. Um, I think, you know, it's frustrating when everything moves, when you wake up one day and you're just trying to get your work done and you don't know where, you know, all the navigation changed or <laughs> everything looks different. Most people, most people don't want that to happen. And so it's a, it's a delicate, it's a delicate thing to try to do. Um, so just making an entirely new version of the app has proven to be uh, a great way to do it. Although I, I think it's kind of risky from a, a business standpoint. Not that I don't recommend doing it, but it's just not my business to worry about exactly. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm sure it involves customer support and uh, a lot of other factors that you have to take into account if you're if you have three live versions of an application versus just one. Yep. So how um, how complete is this in terms of are you pretty much done developing it? Like it does what it needs to do? Are there like ongoing concerns where you're going to add more features or you have to deal with new bugs that crop up because browsers are changing? There's definitely been a lot of ongoing support um, and updates. Um, One of the most difficult platforms to support is Android. It's historically been really difficult to handle any kind of input from Android. going back to, I think, the beginning. So Android uses Chrome under the hood, but the way that its keyboards integrate with 
the operating system and browsers and any application is to treat the keyboard itself as if it's uh, what's known as an IME. So uh, rather than um, thinking of the keyboard as like a literal keyboard that we're used to, a QWERTY keyboard for English, they treat every um, kind of writing operation as a composition. So I don't know if you've ever tried to type like a composed character on your keyboard where you press like option U and then U and then you get like an umlaut over the character. Every key press on Android kind of represents itself as the same thing. So as a result, there's no way to tell exactly what key was pressed. Like on a desktop computer or any other platform, if you press the A key, you get a key down event in JavaScript and you get that uh, has a key code and you can translate translate that into A. Pretty straightforward. On Android, like that's not possible. And as a result, Android was like the buggiest platform for tricks and basically every other editor on the web. And fortunately, that recently got better. Um, there's a new spec for input events. They're called level two input events. Um, and so there's before input is an event, and then there's a, a new input event. And the, these events have more metadata about the type of input. So... For example, if you press a key A, the event not only contains the text that was typed, but also the type of editing operation. So that would just be, I think it's just called insert text. And there's a, there's a, I think 20 or 30 of these input types. And those translate really neatly into like the editing operations that Trix performs. So I think it was recently in the last year we added support for these level two input events um, for all browsers that support them. Currently, that's Chrome and Safari, and I think Firefox is on the way. And just across the board, it provides even more reliable editing experience, but significantly better on Android. So I'm really excited about that. I think it kind of is a game changer for the future of editors on the web. So uh, with the kind of stuff that you guys do with Basecamp, if I remember correctly, it's it's a lot of it's a tool mostly for developers and develop software development managers. Is that correct? Not specifically uh, software, but for it's really for any team or group of people working together on a project, and that could be any kind of project. It's an alternative. I mean, I think of it as an alternative to email, like giant reply all chains. But you know, it's a tool. It's a home base for all your communication with your team. So do you find that a lot of people are trying to be productive on their phones and that that Android thing is a huge boon for what you're doing? Yeah, so Basecamp, we have, uh, you know, it's web-based, but we also have mobile apps um, for iOS and Android. They also are web-based under under the hood, but they're, they have native features. And I don't recall what percentage of, People are using uh, Basecamp mobily, but it's pretty big. And Android is a growing fragment of that. And yeah, I, I mean, it was it was as far as customer support issues related to tricks go, you know, Android was the big one. And fortunately, that is no longer the case. Uh, I'd say in the last six months or so after we updated tricks. So, Javon, not necessarily related to what we've been talking about up to this point, but related to tricks, why, um, why did you all decide to open source it? Like you obviously could have kept this just as internal IP. What was the motivation for throwing it up on GitHub and letting anybody who wanted to use it in their projects too? I think it's just, it's, it's the way we do things at, at Basecamp more often. You know, we, um, there's always the hope that like the community will fix all the bugs for you kind of thing, which doesn't really pan out. Um, yeah. It's partly goodwill. When, when we do have customers that are technical, they really enjoy us sharing like details about the editor when they report a problem about it. We can point to an issue on GitHub and say, oh, this is a, a Firefox bug that'll be fixed in the next release and it's all there. But typically, like the way things go, whoever develops a piece of software at Basecamp has the option to open, open source it. I mean, except for Basecamp itself. And if the developers are interested in kind of taking on the um, community aspect and the documentation aspects and all those things, then they're free to do it. I think just generally it's a, you know, 
it's a positive experience and it, it feels good. But also there's a lot of people who are suffering in the same way we were at that time with difficult editors and we didn't want them to have to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes, that makes sense. This also ties in with some of the stuff I've seen. I can't remember if it was DHH or someone else at the Basecamp team, but basically talking about how the existence of competitors in your space who do well doesn't necessarily impact Basecamp's business or the way you operate yourself. So um, this seems to kind of fit in line with that ethos too. Yeah, I just don't think there's, there's really, you know, it's like, um, no one's stolen tricks and created a better business because they had our source code. You know what I mean? Like, it, <laughs> Yeah, for sure. It still takes a lot of work to create a great product. And, you know, just having the tools doesn't really give you all the ingredients, but sharing them is the right thing to do if, if you can. It's made tricks better just being open source, even if, you know, the community contributions aren't enormous. We do get a lot of great bug reports from open source users who aren't using Basecamp. And as a result, those things get fixed and end up in Basecamp and everyone's better for it. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you for that. You know, I'm a big, I'm a big open source consumer and proponent. So I always like when I see more notable companies participating in that sort of thing. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, poking around the, the GitHub repo, as one does. And uh, notice that everything's in CopyScript. Curious, is that still the principal develop, front-end development language at Basecamp, or is that specific to the Trix project? It was the um, primary flavor of JavaScript for a long time at Basecamp, and kind of uh, it was the default in Ruby on Rails for a long time. Um, we started working on Trix in 2013, and it doesn't sound that long ago, but in tech, it's like you know, a hundred years ago. That's a long um, time. Yep. Like uh, I was kind of taking a little history tour. Um, uh, the ES6 spec didn't exist or it existed, but wasn't finalized then. Like Babel didn't exist then. Webpack barely existed then. You know, all these all these frameworks that are ubiquitous today, you know, React didn't exist then. So CoffeeScript was... I mean, I, I'm still really fond of CoffeeScript, but we're not using it for writing new code these days. New library code, we're mostly writing in um, TypeScript. And then application code is uh, just kind of vanilla ES6. If I was going to start over today with Trix, it would certainly be done in TypeScript. And it may end up being TypeScript one day, but it's, it's just a ton of work to port a project yeah. like that. I do think that CoffeeScript is hurting us in the public, uh, in the open source realm. Oh. Currently, you have as many people wanting to to develop in it. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. This six years is long enough that there's a whole generation of developers who probably have not worked with it at all, who have come into the into the market or into the just the development scene in general, uh, and who are more used to maybe TypeScript, but probably just like you said, vanilla ES6. Yeah, and I to I totally understand it. Um, I don't fully understand the hate for CoffeeScript. Like it was, it was really influential on all many modern JavaScript features. And I think it was a really successful project overall in that it pushed JavaScript forward and it made writing JavaScript bearable at the time. But I, I do think it's, it's on, you know, it's trending downwards in usage. So you guys are a Ruby shop and you're the ones primarily maintaining it. Do you find that it's, I, it seems like coffee shop might be the right choice for you guys because it's more familiar for your developers and, you know, transpiles to regular JavaScript. So why bother? Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, the why bother thing, I thought that for a really long time. Um, and eventually, just as uh, tooling and libraries and all these things move forward in a different direction, at a certain point, it, it doesn't make sense to ignore them. And... There are a number of like modern features in JavaScript that are uh, that have made you know ES6 and beyond have made writing plain JavaScript a lot more enjoyable. But also, there's features in those newer specs that you just can't take advantage with CoffeeScript now. And it's just where it's just the direction of the JavaScript. So at a certain point, we made the call to stop writing CoffeeScript kind of as a company. So you know, code for Basecamp application code 
uh, we just kind of drew a line, line in the sand and started writing all new code using a really vanilla Babel setup. It really wasn't that rough of a transition. I mean, even for, we have a lot of people that contribute code at Basecamp, designers and even sometimes support people and certainly programmers or programmers who primarily write Ruby. And once we laid out a, you know, a few good examples, people caught on. I still, I'm still totally fond of CoffeeScript, but it, it's starting to feel old. That said, I don't think we would have made tricks. Like, I don't think it would have been a successful project if it didn't exist at the time. Like, writing JavaScript was too cumbersome at the time. Well, are there any more questions or comments from the peanut gallery? Nothing on my end. I think I'm pretty good. I got a lot of my questions answered. All right. Well, I think uh, maybe it's time to wrap up then. Do you have anything else you want to add, Javon? Oh, one thing I, I wanted to mention, Trix has been around a long time. And since then, um, there are a number of great editors that have come out that take a similar approach. Uh, and in no way am I saying that they copied Trix's approach. It's just there's a contemporary way of building editors now. And there's projects like ProseMirror and Draft and Slate. So it's great news for people building applications that need editors. There's You have choices now and you have reliable choices, reliable open source choices. So the landscape is just much better than it was even five years ago. Cool. Awesome. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give you full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. Well, with that, let's uh, go ahead and get some picks. Uh, Javon, were you informed about picks? I was. Um, I kind of caught on last minute just from your document and tried to just like look through my browser history and came up with a couple of things, but uh, <laughs> I have two. And All right. Well, if you're ready, you go ahead and go first. Sure. So one is a uh, recent introduction into the HTML spec um, for form submissions. So an API for form submissions. So we've always been able to call the submit method on a form to submit it, but it didn't do a lot of the things like um, run client-side validations or emit the submit event. So there's a new request submit method being introduced that uh, makes interacting with forms with JavaScript uh, much, much nicer. And I'll share a link to that with you guys. And then... This other one is, I've, I've been recently trying to make the switch to Firefox as, as my daily driver. And I look at a lot of code on GitHub, just generally. And the thing that killed me was the, the font for code using Firefox on GitHub was not San Francisco SF Mono. It, was, it would like fall back to Curry or something. But it, in Chrome, it would use the Mac OS SF Mono font. So I uh, managed to kind of hack it together using uh, Firefox's like user content CSS script that you can eject um, CSS. And I'll share a link to the a, a gist on GitHub, how to do that. Awesome. Chris, what do you got? Couple for me this week. So uh, the first is um, I tend to work with Flexbox or old school floating divs a lot more than um, CSS grid, but... Sarah Drasner last week released this really awesome GUI-driven project, uh, CSS Grid Generator. So you can literally, it's like you specify the number of rows and columns you want and how much space you want between each one and how kind of wide relative to the whole thing each one should be. And then you select the grids you actually want content in and it spits out the code to make it so. Um, So you can obviously do some pretty basic layouts with CSS Grid, but if you wanted to do some really interesting magazine style layouts, some really creative stuff, this also makes it super easy and 
kind of takes the whole having to understand all of the magic behind the scenes to, or if you're someone like me who likes to reverse engineer stuff to understand how it works, this is a really, really, really awesome tool for that. So that is my first one. The second is a Twitter thread from um, Alex Russell, who works over at um, Google's Chrome project. He um, He's responding to a tweet someone made about... Um, Lori Voss actually made a tweet in jest about um, just adding React to browsers by default. Alex took it seriously, but wrote a really interesting kind of explainer on why browsers don't just bake a lot of these more popular libraries into their source code. Not just React, but there was calls for this with jQuery back in the day. And, you know, talks about some of the work they're doing to incorporate some of the concepts from these frameworks into how native browsers work. And, uh, but it was just kind of like a really interesting look behind how the sausage is made. The third one for me, not related to code, um, was this really interesting article I read recently about um, a gentleman with early stage dementia and a lot of the challenges he faces, a lot of the assumptions people make about the disease and some of the kind of interesting and sometimes less awesome things that he has to deal with in terms of how he kind of manages living with this illness at an age when he still has a lot of life ahead of him. Um, so it was just, for me, like a really interesting, just a really interesting non-development related thing that I thought folks might enjoy. And that's it for me this week. All right, Christopher? Sure, I'm going to break the trend here. I just have a single pick this week. I am a proponent of the burgeoning movements to get people off of services like Medium and get them back to running their own blogs on their own websites. To that ex- uh, extent, I saw recently... I forget where I first saw it. I think it was probably Twitter. Uh, there is something from Matthew Dutour who has made a medium to own blog application, essentially. Uh, you run it. It's an OJS application. You run it. You feed it some information and it creates you a blog, simple and easy, and basically gets you set up and running. Uh, I believe it's driven by Gatsby, uh, GitHub, and a few other widely known and widely used technologies. And I just thought it was a really interesting idea to actually create a little node app that helps people make that move without it being an exhausting thing where they have to spend a bunch of time researching and setting up and do I install WordPress and all this other stuff? And the answer is no, you don't need to install WordPress. It can be a lot easier than that. So anyway, I think that's a really cool idea and I wanted to promote it. So I will give you guys a link. Awesome. And Amy? Yep. I just have one today because I know we have a lot of newer developers that listen pretty often. I think I saw this on Hacker News. It's uh, seven absolute truths I learned as a junior developer. Uh, I guess this girl has been a developer now for 10 years. So, and she says she's senior. Oh, there's a lot of good advice, a lot of good reminders in here. So that'll be my pick for this week. All right. Well, I think we had a good show. Thanks everybody for joining us. Oh, wait, no, I've got to, I got to do my pick. Sorry. Wait, wait, I did that a little too early. I was eager. <laughs> uh, I've got some good picks for you. Music, as it often is. So, oh, oh, and I've got I've got one other one too. I gotta I gotta pick. So Mario and Chill is perhaps well, it's definitely made my top five list of Mario albums in the video game remix community. So I would highly suggest checking out Mario and Chill. I don't exactly know how to describe it other than to say that I think it's good. And uh, Chill might be a little too. It's a chill album, but it's not chill as in utterly relaxed and boring it's chill as in i don't know go listen to it also this is an old album so mario and chill just came out this month there's an old one that i discovered by chiptunes for autism called catharsis and it's the kind of music that you know if you're having trouble relaxing and having trouble falling asleep or something like that it's just really good quasi ambient electronic that can help you kind of let go and, and relax a bit. So I'm going to pick that. And also, because, you know, Chris always enjoys story time, I'm going to pick this toilet auger from Walmart, which if you get it at Walmart, <laughs> only seven bucks instead of being much more pricey if you try to find one on Amazon, probably because Walmart ships it to store and it's kind of big and you don't have to pay for, you know, the included quote free shipping when you shop at walmart for items like this so a toilet auger is is like ten thousand times better than a plunger because plungers nobody makes a good plunger anymore like nobody makes a plunger that plunges they're all like meant to look cute or fun like they have these weird ripples in them but then when you actually press on them they just kind of bend over and they don't do their job the toilet auger is for serious business 
And what you do is it's kind of an L-shaped thing and you stick it in the toilet uh, with the with the protected piece first so you don't scratch the porcelain. And then you just kind of hook it in and then lean it back. And then you've got a firm rod and then you've got this spring coil type of thing. When you look at the picture, you'll see it's it's not it, it almost looks like a bow. It's and you just kind of unhook it to start using it and pull it back. But you just kind of jam it in there and then start twisting the knob at the end. And I, I can't if you haven't seen one of these things, I can't really describe it well, but it's not complicated at all. It's extremely simple. And you just start twisting the thing and then pushing and twisting and pulling and pushing and twisting. And it'll clean up your toilet. Like you you won't have any of these like struggles that you have with the plunger. And we had a bathroom emergency. It was actually something that was so bad that we had to get the plumber over who brought an auger that was like, instead of being mine is like folded. It's like five feet four or five feet long they brought one that was like closer to eight or some so like really huge because the problem was actually down in the pipe beyond the toilet the, the, it wasn't the, the clog wasn't in the toilet it was down in the pipe outside of the porcelain but anyway i just like pro tip for life get one of them pick it up for six bucks it works way better than a plunger and i yeah just save yourself frustration get an auger also called toilet snake. That's it. Anyway, with the with all that crappy stuff out of the way, now it's time to say adios. Crappy stuff. Well played. Hey. <laughs> all right. Well, adios. Thanks for joining. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more.